We are now just chatting. All right. Everyone all cozy, got your snacks, got your brains ready. Let's start. So the last time we were talking, we were covering the foundations of evolutionary theory and what its value is in helping us understand all the various shapes that life takes. And we saw how this naturally occurring process of evolution, it's very passive, it's like gravity basically. This passive process is going to shape functional adaptations and it selects them because their inherited variations solve adapted problems, those related however distantly to reproductive success. That's evolution in a nutshell. Inheritance, variation, differential reproduction. And we also saw how some features of the organism aren't adaptations, but byproducts or random, random mistakes, random perturbations in development. So the whiteness of a bone is a byproduct of the materials it's made of. The color of bones is not an adaptation, even if bones themselves are. And your bones may differ a little from mine because of some random variation, some noise. You get bumped during development, you break a leg, you have a genetic mutation, whatever. And we also covered why so much of life seems to converge on these similar solutions to these adaptive problems, like how lots of species have eyes that they evolve independently. A lot of species converge on similar solutions to adaptive problems because there are far more ways of solving them, of rather, of failing to solve them efficiently and correctly. So there are lots of ways to not be able to see, but because seeing is useful, a lot of organisms settle on very similar solutions to vision. So today what we're gonna do is take this evolutionary approach that we covered last time and focus in on a rather important part of biology, which is the psychology of living things. We'll talk a lot about humans, but we're gonna talk about other species as well because the same process applies here. And so we're gonna be taking our first steps towards a deeper understanding into the functional structure of brains and nervous systems. What are the inputs that they use? What are the outputs that they generate? And start thinking about all things like behaviors, feelings, memory, consciousness, the entirety of mental life. We're gonna try and find the adaptations in our brains. And we're gonna be building a foundation for understanding how the minds of all living things are shaped and why they take the forms that they take. Another fun part of what we're going to do today, as I've mentioned before, is explain why there really isn't a you in your head anywhere. This idea of a self, a you, that doesn't really line up with what actually exists. As it turns out, this single idea of a, a you, a unified self somewhere in the head, it's a, it's a bad description of how the mind is structured and worked, even if it functions nicely as a useful linguistic shorthand for describing the behavior of organisms. It, it's more useful than it is accurate. And also as we covered in the last lecture, and this is very important to carry on, is that the bodies of living things are divided up into lots and lots of different pieces. We can start with what we see below the neck for now and then move up to the above the neck stuff later because the same process shaped everything but it's just easier to understand the principles when you first start talking about bodies before you start talking about the brains. So below the, nuffs, below the next stuff, we have organs, we have lungs, hearts, livers, kidneys, intestines, as well as all sorts of other specialized systems and tissues, things like bones, your marrow, muscles, fat, skin, blood, immune systems. There's so many of these different little component parts, these different adaptations. And these are divisions that we see across all species, not just humans, it's in cats, it's in birds, it's in worms, it's everywhere. This division of biological labor is no evolutionary accident. The reason we have all these divisions in structures and systems and organs is because the adaptive problems that organisms face are all rather specific in nature. And the efficient solution to any one of these problems requires a different mutually exclusive form than the solution to others. So hearts, they're very good at pumping blood, 
but they're not very good at exchanging gas. And that's because the demands of pumping blood are far different from the demands of respiration, of breathing. And so the organs that we need differ because the problems they solve are different. Locks and keys. Different locks require different shaped keys. Hearts are good at pumping blood, not so good at breathing because the demands of the tasks are different. Lungs are very good at breathing, not very good at pumping blood because the demands of these tasks are different. And we can use an analogy here and start thinking about kitchen life, whether you're at home or whether you're at a restaurant. And there are many different demands that have to be met if you're going to run a successful kitchen and prepare edible food that people actually want. You might need a freezer, store your ingredients, prevent spoilage. Or if you don't have a freezer, you at least need a way of constantly getting fresh ingredients into your kitchen. You need to solve this metaphorical adaptive problem of food storage and spoilage somehow. Let's, let's say you settle on the freezer. A lot of restaurants and a lot of homes use freezers in their kitchen to prevent food from spoiling. Well, these freezers would need to be good at reducing the temperature in the air, enough to stop the food inside from rotting, but not too cold to the point that you're going to destroy the integrity of your food, and certainly not too cold that you're going to kill anyone who enters the freezer. If you have a freezer that you reduce to absolute zero, it's very good at freezing food, but it's not actually good at solving the problems of storing your food because people are going to die when they walk into it and you're going to destroy the food that you put inside. And on top of that, these hyper cold freezers also wouldn't be very efficient in general, even if they did solve those problems well of storing your food, because there are energy and costs in storing the food. You don't need to get the food down to absolute zero. You don't want to cool it too much and you don't want to spend too much energy being inefficient at solving this task. You want to get to just the right temperature and use only the minimum amount of energy needed to do it. And this is why refrigeration units vary substantially based on the types of things that you intend to cool. And why many of us have both a refrigerator and a freezer in our kitchens, depending on precisely how cold we intend to keep the objects we put inside of them. And it's not just about the temperature either. You also want to make sure your freezers are the right size. Because there are storage costs to space. If the freezer is too big, it's going to eat into too much of your space. You're not going to have room to have things that aren't freezers. If the freezer is too small, you're not going to be able to store the food you need inside the freezer. Or get people in to get the food and get out. And so if you want to run your kitchen as efficiently as possible, the shape and capacity of this refrigerator has to meet the specific demands of the task and our specific budget constraints and our space constraints, and all of it. And the demands of refrigerating your food, these are far different from that of an oven or a stove, which are going to do the exact opposite. They're going to heat your food up. They're going to raise the temperature of your food, often dramatically. And you cook food for a couple of reasons. Sometimes you want to kill pathogens, little infectious agents that might be on them. And you also want to transform the food in terms of the tastes and the textures that you're going to get. And what makes something a good oven is going to differ substantially from what makes it a good refrigerator. And that goes not just for how much space these things take. You don't need a giant oven the way you might need a large refrigerator. You're going to need to think about what fuel it uses. It might use gas as opposed to electricity. What outputs is it producing? How much heat versus how much cooling and so on. But of course you can't just put your food right on the oven because it's going to burn. You, can't, you don't just take your chicken, raw chicken breast, and drop it on top of an open flame. You need containers that are going to hold this food. You might need some lubricating agents on these containers to prevent the food from sticking to them, like olive oil. And these containers, they make poor heating units. They don't heat your food up. They don't cool your food down. But they also play their specific role. The demands of holding food is different than the demands of cooking it, different than the demands of freezing it. And these containers have their own requirements. They have to be small enough to fit in the oven or on the stove, large enough to hold how much food they need to hold, not too large that they become too difficult to use. The, the list of demands here goes on and on as well. And we keep, we're going to do exactly that. Actually, it's going to keep going on. You have to prepare the food. 
So you need things like spoons. Spoon stir it, knives to cut it, but you don't want just one knife, do you? Because the demands of cutting are gonna vary substantially based on the, on the type of food you intend to cut. And a knife that's meant for cutting steak might not be optimally suited for cutting bread or cheese. A knife suited for use in the kitchen might not be the knife that you want to give the people in the dining area that are actually trying to eat the food that you're serving them. Big butcher knife back in the kitchen, that's not the right knife for the table, for the guests. And these knives, pans, ovens, refrigerators that we're already talking about, well, those are pretty bad at opening bottles. So let's say you want to serve wine to your guests. Well, I guess that means you're going to need a new tool for that. You're not just going to use a knife to chop the cork out of a bottle of wine. Fun as that might be, what you're going to do is you're probably going to break the bottle and you're probably going to hack the cork into a million pieces and that's going to be floating in the wine and no one wants to drink that. And we're just scratching the surface here of the complexity of life in a kitchen. The number of possible tools we might use in there, in what circumstances to solve what tasks. But even though we're just scratching the surface, I think it serves our point here rather well. Which is again that all these functionally specific problems of the kitchen require functionally specific tools to solve them. And the features of these tools that make them good at one solution often make them quite bad at another. <clears throat> so if you think about this, if I asked you to design me a tool that handles every aspect of the cooking process, I want one tool that does everything related to cooking. I feel that would probably be a pretty impossible ask. A knife that can be used to prepare every type of food in the kitchen and refrigerate it and warm it up and hold the food and then you also give this thing to the guests and the guests use this to eat and so on. Such a device doesn't exist because the competing demands of solving one of these tasks begin to trip on the demands of solving others. Something that makes something good at heating food up is probably going to make it bad at cooling food down. Something that makes it good at holding food might make it bad at cutting food. And if you try and design one tool that's going to solve all of these problems, what you're going to end up with is a disaster of a tool that's going to solve none of them because the competing demands start interfering with each other. So we don't just have one tool for every problem. We have many, 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 many different tools for every specific problem. And this is true not just in a kitchen or a car mechanic or a post office, or a manufacturing plant, or an electrical plant, or an internet provider. All these places require their own sets of unique tools, their own sets of functional knowledge. And this is true of our biology for the exact same reasons. Whether man-made or biological in nature, there simply aren't any tools that just do useful things. And if I asked you to design a tool that does useful things, you'll find this to be too underspecified. Like our little multi-tool here. This isn't a tool that does everything. This is a variety of smaller tools that each do their own independent thing. And you can see how much the shapes and sizes vary based on the thing we're trying to do. Effectively here, we just had, we can't have one tool to do everything because it starts tripping on everything else. And this is true in biology as it is in the man-made world. We don't just have one massive bodily organ that pumps blood and breathes air and filters the blood and digests food because we can't. We would end up incapable of doing any of these things well, let alone like at all. We can't do them with this organ, much less outcompete other organisms that had a variety of different specialized systems that actually accomplish these tasks well. So for the same reason we don't get our car fixed at the same place we get our food, which isn't the same place we do our banking and buy our clothes, our body is structured into these different mechanisms. Specialization yields efficiency when it comes to completing a task. So now we've seen this logic works in the world of our tools and our bodies. Let's move up the neck and into the brain, into the head, because the exact same logic holds here as well. Hearts function to pump blood, knives function to cut things, and we might ask, at least in the broadest sense, 
what do brains and nervous systems do? What's the function of our psychology? And we do have a, a very broad answer here, which is that our brains process information, by which I mean they take inputs, whether from the outside world or the internal one, whether signals are coming in through the eyes and ears or up through the nervous system in the body. It takes these inputs and translates them into the outputs of behavior. We take in information, process this, and turn it into behavior. That's what brains and nervous systems do. They're information processing mechanisms. And while this general function works for our brain and nervous system as a description, we quickly find that we need to get a lot more specific than this. It's like if I told you knives function to cut things. Well, we can quickly see that that description becomes too broad as we start thinking about what we want to cut under what circumstances. The demands of cutting steak in the kitchen are different from the demands of cutting steak on a plate. And as these demands vary drastically from task to task, we start to have knives take a plethora of different forms to accomplish those tasks well. Lots of knives for lots of different problems. Similarly, the brain is an information processing organism. And the demands of processing different types of information and translating this into behavior, this varies dramatically depending on what task we're considering. We need to start thinking about all these little tasks that make up this information processing mechanism. Like what form is the information taking? What adaptively relevant information is carried in those inputs? How are those inputs transformed into behaviors? How are those behaviors solving adaptive problems? These are the questions we want to be asking of our brain. And using these questions to guide our thinking on a topic is massively helpful because it points us in the right direction for understanding all the biology and by extension psychology that we see because our psychology is very much biological in nature. So when we're starting on this above the neck journey, our ability to take in light requires very special psychological organs, which begin with our eyes. Make no mistake about it here. Eyes are psychological adaptations. The ability to see doesn't just exist as a default, despite how natural and easy and effortless the process really is for most of us. We just open our eyes and it happens because we have all these mechanisms in there, all these very specialized mechanisms and many moving parts that make our ability to see exist. Now these eyes are pretty good at taking in some very specific parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see here, we call that visual light. That little rainbow band on the bottom of the black bar on top, those are the wavelengths of the electromagnetic electromagnetic spectrum our eyes take in. It's a very small sliver of it. If the wavelengths start getting too slow, like infrared, or too short, I mean too long, like infrared, or too short, like ultraviolet light, our eyes can't take this in. We, we can't process this information, much less anything that exists further out on this spectrum. We don't see radio waves. We don't see x-rays. We don't have the mechanisms to actually process this information. So while our eyes are pretty good at taking in certain forms of light, they're actually rather bad at taking in many others, and they're even worse at taking in something like food or oxygen. The role of the eyes, like the rest of the body, is incredibly functionally specific due to the nature of the adaptive problems that they're solving. So once the input from this light is obtained, we're not done yet. Light comes in, we obtain this information through the eyes, but we still need other functionally specific parts of our brain to translate that into colors. So if those don't function, you end up colorblind. The ability to see color doesn't exist as a default, our brain has to create it. Just like we have mechanisms for perceiving shapes, for perceiving movements, for perceiving the presence of light as signaling a living versus non-living thing. And learning about those things. Is this predator? Is this prey? Is this edible? Is it toxic? Is that a person? Is this person in a good mood or in a bad mood? Each of these tasks is going to require specialized psychological circuits to solve those problems. And on that point, there's actually a very interesting note I want to make about eyes. 
which is that there are other species that can take in visual information we can't. For instance, as we're looking at here, there are some flowers that when you expose them to ultraviolet light, they display patterns on their petals. This is the same flower here under different lighting circumstances. Now, we can't see this. This is ultraviolet light, or at least our representation of what ultraviolet light is. However, certain species that interact with these flowers, like say honeybees, they're pollinators, they can see in this ultraviolet spectrum. And while this is jumping ahead a little bit, it seems like there's a mutually beneficial evolutionary interaction that's occurred here where the flowers are communicating with their pollinators. But this communication is something we're basically blind to. The flowers are presenting information to their pollinators and because we're not pollinating the flowers, there's no real reason that we need to see this information. And the larger point to make about this interaction, at least for now, and this is something we can apply to every aspect of life, we're going to see more examples of this later, is that the world we see, the world we perceive, is not the world as it actually is. What we actually see is a very, very small sliver of what's out there. And it's really worth mentioning here that when I say by what we see, what I mean is what information we take in and what representations we are generating based on what we're taking in. The world we see, the thing we experience inside of our minds is a representation that our brain creates from the inputs that we're getting. So for instance, in response to certain wavelengths of light coming through the eye, our brain will generate a perception of a color, say red or blue. But the redness or the blueness that we see, that we experience, isn't actually a property of what we're observing. It's a property of our brain. It's a property of our nervous system. If you've ever seen the Matrix movie, where people are plugged into the Matrix and they're experiencing this whole world that doesn't actually exist, that's basically what our brain is doing. Except in this case, we're not plugged into anything. Our brains are creating this perception of the world from the inputs it's receiving. But this is not necessarily what the world is. Not in any objective sense of the term. So keep that in mind as we're moving forward here. Everything we see, everything we experience, everything we feel, these are creations of the brain. They're properties of the nervous system. They're not properties of the world. And in any case, if we move forward a little bit, eyes are an outgrowth of varying functionally specific psychological adaptations. Well, so too are the ears. Ears process an entirely different type of information from the eyes. Information they take in comes from different pressure waves traveling through a medium, like air or water. When we speak, for instance, we cause a compression of air molecules. This propagates through neighboring molecules and creates a wavelength through this air we're speaking in. It's like how a ripple in a pond forms when you throw a rock in the middle of it. Our ears are able to pick up on some of these different vibrations and compressions in air particles and translate those into perceptions of sounds. <coughs> then we take these sounds and they are classified by other mental mechanisms as being loud or quiet, speech or not speech, far away or nearby, and so on. If a sound is too loud, we might even have other mental mechanisms that process the sound as pain. If you've ever been to a concert, been around someone screaming, and you feel pain from this, that's another mental mechanism telling you, hey, this sound is so loud, it's actually damaging the machinery inside your ears. You should do something about that. And much like there's a lot of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes don't take in and our brains don't process, there are also sounds that we are functionally deaf to, whether because the wavelengths that they create are too short or too long. So we're not going to be able to hear the high frequency sounds that bats can. And bats use their ability to hear these high frequency sounds to echolocate. They can use their sound capacity, their ability to hear, their auditory capacities effectively to see. And we can't really do that. Similarly, 
there might be some very low frequency wavelengths that say an elephant can hear but a human can't and we're certainly if you ever go into a medical setting if you've got an ultrasound ultrasound is like using like using sound to see but we can't hear it ultrasound machines don't sound like much to us because we don't have the mechanisms for processing them and what i hope we can walk away with all this thinking about when it comes to eyes and ears is not necessarily that you know know everything there is to know about hearing or seeing i certainly don't but rather that these eyes and these ears represent physical outgrowths of our psychologies and accordingly of our brains what makes them really useful is that they're observable by the naked eye as distinct things and that makes them a lot easier to understand and appreciate these ears and eyes they're functionally specific they only process very particular types of information and because of this functional specificity and the nature of the tasks that they're solving they look very different from each other and you could say the same about every other body part also like tongues or noses that take in sensory information they process different types of inputs they generate different types of outputs and they solve much different problems with with much different tools so tongues need to detect the presence say of various chemical compounds in the things that we ingest and they need to inform the rest of the body as to the characteristics of those chemical compounds is this food is it toxic and scents might be important to animals what you smell but these can work on different time frames things that you see are things that are happening now an animal that's smelling something might be smelling something that happened minutes hours days weeks ago and you need much different mental mechanisms to process this information and to know how to use it if you tried to use sense something that you're smelling to determine what's happening right now you might be thrown off because let's say you're smelling a rotting a rotting animal this is something that died a long time ago you need special mechanisms for understanding these types of things and to make this point extremely crystal clear you can go blind without going deaf people can lose their sense of smell without losing their sense of hearing and the reason this can happen is because these are entirely separate mechanisms collecting and processing different inputs and they're made of functionally different parts so if eyes and ears and noses and tongues all come in these different forms and shapes from each other we shouldn't expect any of the rest of the brain to be any different what we consider the brain as a singular object is really more accurately conceived of as many 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 different pieces different mental organs that process very specific types of information and use different rules to process this information to produce different behaviors different outcomes and some parts of our brain are going to be working with information that the other parts are functionally blind to each of these different mental organs what we would call mental modules need different rules for processing information and generating outputs in much the same way each program on your computer works with different inputs and creates different outputs from them so if i'm working in a word processor here the keys w a s and d on my keyboard will produce letters but if i'm working in a different program on my computer say playing a game these exact same keys may instead generate the movement of a character around the digital world these are different programs in this case using the same inputs to generate different outputs and they are completely blind to the functioning of each other the word processor doesn't need to know the game exists and vice versa and these computer programs don't need to agree on what the inputs mean and they don't need to agree on what outputs they generate just like different parts of your brain don't need to agree on inputs they don't need to share information they don't need to agree on outputs the different parts of your brain can just work independently from the other pieces and sometimes that can involve using entirely different inputs or the same input in a different way and we're going to see examples of these in a second so this idea of modularity that our brain is made up of these functionally specific information processing mental organs a lot of them has some rather interesting implications for understanding our psychology and our minds more generally and i'm going to hit you with one of them right now which is the point we started with 
there is no you inside your head. There is no singular you floating around your brain somewhere. Now, we often say things like, I want to learn a different language, or she really wants that dress, as if there was some single entity, some single person that wanted things, as if our brain was this single unified organ. And while that might prove useful, it's certainly easier to say linguistically, because entire organisms need to act in unified, coordinated ways, it's not really an accurate description of our underlying psychological architecture. In much the same way, we might say there's, there's no unified body. There's no real body that you have. The body is linguistic shorthand for a collection of lots of different pieces. It's not like your heart is really your body or your toes are really your body. They're just different pieces. One is not any more your body than the other. These are just useful ways for thinking about the coordination that occurs between all these different organs and cells and systems and tissues. We say the body because they do one thing. You can't have your cake and eat it too. But that doesn't mean they're all the same piece. And to appreciate why there really isn't a you inside your head, we're going to work through three very quick and very interesting examples here. The first of these examples involves some people with some very unique brain damage that reveals this truth to us that there is no you in their head. And the other two examples are relatively normal people like you or I that have no brain damage that I know of. So let's start off with the first one. With respect to this idea of some unique brain damage, some people suffer from epilepsy, which is a disorder characterized by sudden behavioral changes due to electrical malfunctioning in the brain, seizures. Epilepsy is characterized by having these seizures where people are gonna to fall to the ground, jerk and spasm uncontrollably. And if these seizures get too severe, medical intervention is sometimes necessary. And one way people have found to alleviate these seizures is to surgically sever a part of the brain called the corpus callosum. And that's the part of your brain pointed to here. It's a middle part between your left and right hemisphere that forms connections between them. It allows the left and the right half of the brain to talk to each other, metaphorically speaking. So what happens is when you cut this connection between the left and right hemispheres, we're going to refer to these patients now as having a split brain because it's been physically split, more or less, into two parts. And this is a remarkably effective treatment for reducing seizures, because it prevents this electrical storm from propagating across the brain. But that's not all it does. Cutting the means of communication between the two halves also means that information is no longer traveling between the right and the left half. It's not just the seizures that stop traveling, it's a lot of information. Now this is particularly interesting to us because of how the visual and motor systems in our body work. When you're thinking about the visual system here, you might not know this, I didn't for some time. Information that you take in from your left eye is processed in the back right of your brain. And similarly, the right eye goes to the back left. So what happens if these two parts of the brain aren't communicating anymore because you physically cut the corpus callosum? Well, now what you can actually do is you can give different visual information to different parts of the brain. All you have to do is set up some way of dividing the visual field, like put a divider between people's eyes if you want. And now all of a sudden you can give the right and the left hemisphere different bits of visual information that the other one lacks. So as it turns out, it seems that speech is governed by the left side of our brain, not so much the right. And we learn this in part from the split brain patients. So what we do is if we show them something in their right eye, this information is going to go to the left half of the brain, and the left half is where they're going to generate their speech. So if you show them something in their right eye, they can accurately describe verbally what they're seeing. 
So I show you a chicken through your right eye only, and I ask you, what do you see? If you're a split brain patient, you're gonna tell me you see a chicken. If you show them something in the left visual field, now instead, this goes to their right brain. The right brain isn't what, isn't what has the ability to talk. So if you ask them what you see, if you show them something from their left eye, they'll tell you, I don't see anything. If you show them a chicken in the right eye, they'll tell you, I see a chicken. You show them a chicken in the left eye, they'll say, I don't see anything. That's because the part that's talking doesn't have access to the information in the visual system anymore. If you show them something on the left side, this goes to their right brain, the right brain doesn't talk. Right brain can't communicate with the part that talks, and so the part that talks tells you it doesn't see anything. That's interesting, perhaps, but it's expected enough because you physically cut the means of communication. But that's not where our story ends. As it turns out, each half of the brain also primarily controls the muscle and movements of one hand. So again, the right half of your brain controls your left hand. Left half of your brain controls your right hand. It's like your eyes. It goes to the opposite end. So if we instead ask these split brain patients to respond to what they see non-verbally using their hands, we can get much different results. So in this case, you show each half of the brain something different, and you ask them to respond to what they see, pick a corresponding object using their hands. As we can see from the little diagram here, say, if you show them key on the left side, this goes to the right brain. Right brain controls the left hand, left hand selects a key. If you show them ring on the right side, that goes to their left brain, left brain can talk, they can tell you they see ring. But their left hand is selecting the correct object that it sees with the right brain, even though it can't talk, it can't tell you this. So to recap here, if you show something in the left eye, goes to the right brain. If you ask them what they see, because the right brain doesn't talk, they'll tell you nothing. They don't see anything. But if you, it's clear they're still seeing something because if you ask the right brain to respond non-verbally, it can select the correct object using the left hand. So the right side of the brain is seeing something, it's accurately responding, and the other side of the brain doesn't know this. And the story gets even more interesting than that. You can take these split brain patients and show each half of their brain a different picture, as we have been, and ask each hand to respond to what it sees. So in this case, they have eight cards in front of them, four on the left, four on the right. On the left-hand side, you show them a snowy scene, and you ask them to pick something that corresponds to what they see. Left side goes to the right brain, right brain sees snow. This signal goes to the left hand, left hand picks a shovel. You show the right brain a chicken foot. This goes, I mean rather show the chicken foot on the right side, right side goes to the left brain, left brain sees chicken, chicken goes to the right hand, right hand selects a chicken. Both halves are seeing something different, both halves are responding correctly, but neither half can see what the other half is doing. So now what you do is you tell the split brain patient, keep your hands where they are on the objects you selected and you remove the physical divider. So now both eyes can see what both hands selected. Both halves of the brain can figure out what they got. And you ask the split brain patient, why did you select what you selected? Remember, only the left side can talk. The left side doesn't know why the right side picked what it did. What do, the, what do the split brain patients say? They don't say, I don't know. They make up a story. They say, oh, uh, I picked the shovel for cleaning up after the chickens. Now we know this can't be true. We know that's not why they picked what they picked. But the part that's talking doesn't actually know this. The part that's talking only deals with talking. It doesn't deal with the decision-making process necessarily. The implications of this are something we're gonna to return to later. But for now, what I want you to remember is the part that's talking in these split brain patients 
might not be much different than the part of your brain that's talking. When you have an intact brain. So that what I, what I mean here is that the part of you that explains things to other people, that talks to other people, why did you do that? This part may not have any actual insight into why decisions were made. That doesn't stop it from spinning a plausible story. But when we explain why we like and what we like and what we do to other people, we're not necessarily explaining why we like what we like or why we do what we do accurately. We're going to see more examples of that as we go on. But for now, we have ourselves a very interesting question to ask about these, these split brain patients. What do they actually believe then? Do the split brain patients believe the shovel that they picked was there to clean up after the, the chickens? Or does the split brain patient believe the shovel was selected to pick up the snow? And the answer to this question, what does the split brain patient believe is very simple. We're asking a bad question. There is no the patient to talk about. There are two different parts of the brain that know two different things. There is no one belief set in the brain of these people to talk about. There is no one unified person in their head. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's because these people are kind of weird, right? We, we did surgery, we cut their brain in half. There's some physical damage there. They're not normal like you or I, right? But we are absolutely like split brain patients. And I'm gonna give you two examples to think about this. The first, we're gonna start with dieting. Let's say you have someone that wants to lose weight. So they go on a diet. Take in fewer calories, weight goes down. We all know this. They want to eat fewer calories to achieve their goal of losing weight. But what happens when you see a nice, attractive, high-calorie food that they happen to love, like a piece of cake? As many people who have tried to been on a diet are aware of, there's a bit of a mental struggle here. You see the cake. I don't want to eat the cake. Calorie-dense foods, they taste delicious. But they also don't want to eat the cake. Because calorie-dense foods are going to make it harder to lose weight. So what's the person want? Do they want to eat the cake? Or do they not want to eat the cake? The answer here is, again, we're asking a bad question. There is no the person in their head. There's one part of the brain that's assessing the desirableness of the food source that they're seeing. There's a separate part pursuing a long-term goal of weight loss. These are two very different parts of the brain using somewhat the same input, seeing a piece of cake. And this goes to different parts of the brain and they're using different rules to generate different behavioral outputs. You can't have your cake and eat it too. But it's trying to, because there are two different parts generating two different sets of outputs. But neither one of these parts is more the person than the other one. Any more than your heart is more your body than your lungs. So because you can't eat your cake and not eat your cake, the outputs of these different mechanisms have to be coordinated somehow. This conflict has to be resolved because you have to pick one behavior. You cannot eat the cake and not eat the cake simultaneously. But the important point is that what we're seeing here is that we have a relatively normal intact brain with two different pieces doing two different things and not necessarily agreeing, just like our split brain patients. But let's say you still don't believe me. Well, if you're still not believing me, that we're like these split brain patients in more ways than we might think. I have an example that's going to demonstrate this to you in real time. Question of interest here is you see two squares labeled A on the top, B in the middle. What color is the square A and what color is square B? I don't know the name for the exact colors, obviously, but A is a dark gray, B is a light gray. I don't know what we want to call those. Let's just say light and dark gray. 
And we can see this clearly just by looking at them. Except because this is a psychology lecture, you want to know something's wrong with this example. And that's, in this case, A and B are actually the exact same color. So now you know these are the same color because I just told you these are the same color. One part of your brain that took in auditory information knows that these are the same color. And one part of your brain seems to disagree with the other one, right? Maybe you don't believe these are the same color yet, you might know that I told you they're the same color, but you, you the person, can look at this and very clearly see these are different colors. That's what you, the person, believe. You think they're different colors. So let's draw some lines of the same color through square A and B, straight down the middle, right between them. Now they start looking a little bit more like the same color, don't they? You can verify this yourself if you want, if you think I'm trying to mislead you. You can go get this picture. You can screen capture it. You can go look it up yourself. It's called Adelson's Same Color Illusion. And you can put these in Photoshop, Paint, GIMP, whatever program you use. Cut out square A, cut out square B, put the colors next to each other. You're going to see they're exactly the same color. And there are two points to think about here. First, we can think about this point I made earlier concerning how all of our perceptions, all of our experiences are generated by the brain, not by objective qualities about the world. On the left side, A and B are the same color. Our brain is generating a perception that they are not. There are some qualities of the objective world that are not being accurately represented by our brain. The colors we see are properties of our brain making certain assumptions about the inputs they're receiving. In this case, our brains are making the assumption about seeing three-dimensional objects, shadows, and patterns, and they're wrong. We're feeding them a novel stimulus that they're not used to seeing in historical ancestral environments. The output that we're feeding them is something we weren't adapted to deal with. And so we're getting outputs that are inaccurate. In fact, every time you look at a two-dimensional picture and think you see a three-dimensional picture in your brain somewhere, you're actually experiencing an illusion. You're not seeing me on your screen. You're just seeing little pixels of light flashing across the screen. But your brain is taking that light and it's generating it into a perception of seeing me, a three-dimensional picture on a two-dimensional screen. Every time we see two-dimensional pictures like this, we're feeding our brain an illusion, in a manner of speaking. And we're going to get to the, back to this point in other lessons. But the second point I want to discuss here comes in the form of a question. What do you believe about the colors A and B in these squares? Do you believe they're the same color? Or do you believe they are different colors? Well, if you're a lot like me, a lot like other normal people, right now one part of your brain believes they are the same color. It can see it on the right. I've told you it, and you can verify it yourself. Another part of your brain disagrees. The visual system is in fact very stubborn about this, and I am continuing to see A and B as different colors. That part seems to believe something else. You have two parts of your brain holding two different representations about the exact same input, and one of these is no more you than the other. So how these conflicting behavioral outputs are managed is a very interesting question. But we know where the answer can't lie. It can't lie in the form of any single central intelligence, consciousness, decision maker inside the brain. An executive, capital Y, you, that lives inside your head somewhere. If you ever seen the movie Men in Black, you might be familiar with this scene where there is an alien that's been piloting around a human robot and it controls all the various functions through all these levers and takes in the information through the main robot body. <clears throat> this is probably intuitively how a lot of us think about our consciousness or our psychology, that there's this little you sitting inside your head. 
getting these inputs from the eyes and the ears and the noses and using these to make decisions and send signals around your body. This is, this is the you, the soul, the self, the single unified being inside of your head. And we know this can't be true because this raises more questions than it solves. Specifically, how would this little tiny you inside your head make decisions? You're trying to explain the functioning of this big, complex brain made up of all these different pieces by positing another smaller but similarly complex brain inside of it. That doesn't get us very far in explaining it. We're just pushing the problem back a level. Oh, our brain makes decisions by having this other very small brain inside of it. Well, how does that brain make decisions? Oh, well, you see, that brain has another very small brain inside of it. It reminds me of a fun little story where ancient times, there's this wise man and a student. And the student asked the wise man, teacher, what does the earth rest on? And the wise man says, let me think about it. Come back tomorrow, I'll have your answer. The student comes back the next day. The wise man said, I figured it out. The world rests on the back of a giant turtle. The student says, oh, okay. But wait a minute. What's that turtle on? The wise man says, that's a good question. Let me think about it. Come back the next day. The student comes back the next day. The wise man said, that turtle rests on the back of an even bigger turtle. The student says, well, then what's the second turtle standing on? Comes back the next day. Before the student can ask the wise man a question, the wise man just shouts out, it's turtles all the way down. This can't be how the brain works. There can't be a single you inside your head that makes decisions magically. What we have to do is explain the complexity of the brain by breaking it down into progressively smaller and smaller pieces that then require less explanation. So rather than being a single you inside your head somewhere, there are instead many, many, many different parts, many different yous. In a metaphorical and perhaps maybe even somewhat literal manner of speaking, all of these different yous that are inside your head do different things. They know different things. They want different things. And they may or may not be directly speaking to each other. One you wants to eat the cake. Another you wants to lose weight. There isn't one true you inside your brain, but just lots of different pieces that want lots of different things and know lots of different things and do lots of different things. Again, exactly like the rest of our body works. If you have a cut, your body is going to, your heart rather, is going to continue to pump blood, even if that means blood is going to escape through the cut. Similarly, other parts are going to try and close this wound. Your blood is going to clot and try and close the wound. Stem the leak. Now, clotted blood's not very good for pumping. And asking about a central you would be no different in that case than asking, well, does the body want to pump blood or does the body want to clot blood? The answer is that we don't have a singular body with singular functions. Just lots of different pieces working in their own relatively coordinated way on their own independent tasks. Now, I know this might sound weird to think about because for many of us, it feels like there's a you in your head somewhere, doesn't it? A consciousness. A single thing that's experiencing and knowing and remembering and seeing and behaving. Everything. It feels like there's a you in there somewhere. But that raises another interesting question, doesn't it? How would you know if there was more than a single consciousness in your brain? So after all, you might see me walking around. 
And you might assume there's a consciousness in my head somewhere. But do you really know there is? And I'm not trying to tell you that I'm a robot or anything. But perhaps I have no conscious experiences at all. How would you know if I did? How would you know if I had any awareness? I could be behaving as if I did, but what if I didn't? And the same question I would pose to you about your own brain. How would you know if there was another or many different consciousnesses floating around inside your head? Which reminds me of another fun little story. We have two philosophers talking, and one asks the other, well, today we know the Earth is, it's a sphere, it's round, and it's rotating as it orbits the sun. But why did people used to think that the Earth was flat and stationary, while the sun and moon revolved around the Earth? Second philosopher thinks for a second, and then replies, well, I suppose that's just because it feels like the Earth is flat and stationary, doesn't it? It feels like we're not moving, and it feels like the moon and the sun are rotating around us. To which the first philosopher replies, well, how do you suppose it would feel if the Earth was round and rotating? And it's an interesting question to think about how it feels to be a split-brain patient. We can't really know by asking them, because as we've seen from their examples, the brain that's talking doesn't seem to know either. The part of the brain that's talking doesn't know what it's like to be the other side of the brain. What we can note, however, is that if there was a single you in your head, you probably wouldn't feel conflicted over whether to eat cake or stick to a diet. Consciousness is a curious thing, for sure, and I'm not here to tell you that I know what consciousness is because I don't. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it exists myself. But what I can tell you is that despite how it may feel to us intuitively, this idea of that single you in your head can't be the right way to understand the, ar the architecture of our psychology, of our brain. It's not one thing. It's many different pieces, many different modules, all functionally specific in what they do, like the rest of our bodies. And they may or may not communicate with each other and share this information. So the question I'm gonna leave you with today is, how would it feel to have a brain that was made up of multiple pieces rather than a single one?